you know, then things definitely turn weird uh, when the transformation from Yeltsin to Putin happened. Yes. Um, you know, we all, none of us had any illusions about who Putin was. Putin was a known quantity. He was the deputy mayor of St. Petersburg when I was a student in St. Petersburg. Uh, he, he was kind of known as, um, well, I mean, he, there were all sorts of stories that were told about him back then. And when he first came to, um, to power in Moscow, it was sort of widely understood that he was doing it. And Yeltsin even writes about this in his biography uh, because Yeltsin needed help getting out of the country and escaping pro prosecution. And um, there, there had been some indication that Putin had done that for his previous boss, the, the mayor of St. Petersburg, Anatoly Sobchak. So, you know, the sort of investigative journalism community was very suspicious of Putin when he when he first arrived. Um, but the Western journalism community loved him. And this loved was Putin. Yeah. Yeah. And this was, you know, I, I had already become disillusioned with American journalism before that for because they had misreported a lot of things about post-communist Russia. But that was kind of like, the last straw for me, I think. Traditionally, think tanks do a lot of thinking, and the Heritage Foundation still does that, but it also, thankfully, has begun doing. Heritage has built a massive investigative and litigation operation out of its headquarters to save this country from the corruption that is taking it over, both actual, literal corruption, financial corruption, there's a lot of that, but also ideological and moral corruption. And to fight back, Heritage is engaging in almost 50 separate lawsuits against various government entities to try and pry out information to bring a little sunlight to the process that even Congress can't get. And it's been working. They produce documents exposing the Biden crime family to the rest of the world. You've read those stories and help kill the sweetheart deal that Biden's DOJ tried to make with his son, Hunter Biden. Heritage has also developed a comprehensive plan to dismantle the deep state, the swamp, by staffing the next administration with people who know what they're doing, thousands of Americans who on day one can start to make this country better. So it's important work. Again, it's not just thinking, it's doing. And if you want to support it, go to heritage.org slash Tucker. Can you just back up one click? What did they misreport? So they would, uh, they would send somebody out to some provincial town like Samara with a with an assignment, um, find the thriving, emerging middle class, right? And so you'd go out to a place where there's like a barter economy, yeah. right? And <laughs> and people are doing subsistence farming, you know. And they would a they would ask around until they found somebody who had, you know, a VCR or who or who had been on a vacation to a pizza once or something like that. And then they would do a whole story, like you know transition to capitalism, you know, flourishing, uh, you know, the emerging middle class is, you know, everything's happening right on schedule. And meanwhile, the country was really, in the Yeltsin years, was really doing very badly, right? It's in, in contrast to, to now, um, you know, Russia was experiencing sort of record levels of early deaths. And, yes. Um, all kinds of horrific things that they weren't telling people back home. And so, Why? because the, the, the expat community and, you know, I, I don't really know exactly how this works, but the, there was a monoculture about the reporting there that is very similar to what it's like now in America. Yes. Um, but there it was sort of cartoonized. It's a very small community. Everybody knew everybody else. And, you know, whatever the Washington Post and the New York Times wrote about, um, pretty much everybody else followed their lead. There was almost nobody um, among the reporters who even spoke Russian, right? That, that was totally how discouraged. Can you, how can you cover a country if you don't speak the language? Because that was the tradition. I mean, if you people would come in, they would cycle in there for a few years. They would work with translators. They stayed in a little compound on Kutuzovsky Prospect, which is, you know, right near the center of the city. Uh, in the Soviet days, it was sort of walled off by by design, but they continued living there for some reason that I didn't really understand. Um, and with a couple of exceptions, you know, I can think there was a Boston Globe reporter who was fantastic, right, while I was there. Um, but for the most part, you know, people came in and they they just treated it as a, you know, as a third world backwater. It's like, you know, if you read The Quiet American, right? Yes, it, was, it was that attitude toward- But I don't understand, 
so if you don't speak a language, I mean, I've lived here for 55 years. I speak English as a native speaker, barely understand the country. It's just too complicated. Right. But if you can't speak the language, you, you just don't understand it at all. You, you have no hope of understanding it, do you? I'm, uh, that's what I thought, right? And and this was not just the journalists, but also the diplomats there. But, you know, this the was- The diplomats didn't speak Russian. Diplomats didn't speak Russian. You're, you know, we, we have a- the the ambassador to 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 Russia, Michael McFall, he couldn't he could barely do put a sentence together in Russian. So uh, it was. It what was, is that? That just seems like a baseline requirement. So the the way it was explained to to us was that this this was something that was a hangover from um, the American diplomatic experience in China before the Maoist revolution, where the diplomats were deemed to have been too close to the local population, didn't warn. Uh, the people back home, what was happening. So uh, they made a, a habit out of cycling people from spot to spot so that they wouldn't become too uh, accustomed to the culture uh, or too acculturated, right? Uh, which I can maybe see the rationale for a diplomat, maybe, but for a journalist, it makes no sense at all, right? So uh, to, not, to not understand the, the, the place that you're reporting on, um, so by then I, you know, I, <laughs> no, I, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to not understand the place you're reporting on that. And I think, I think we can agree on that. Right. Yeah. But so, so it was, it was, it was a, a strange activity that a lot of them were involved in where they, they mostly interviewed the English speaking officials in the Yeltsin government, right? Uh, a lot of them had gone to Harvard, um, and they were getting one very specific version of what Russia was going through, what its challenges were. And at the time, by then I had already branched off. I had left um, the, the expat paper, the Moscow Times. I started up my own newspaper, which was like a nightlife guide. And I started doing this thing in opposition to that, which was I would go around the country getting jobs in weird places. Like I, I was worked as a bricklayer in Siberia. Really? Uh, yeah, I, I did. Um, I, I worked at a monastery in Mordovia. What did you do in the monastery? At construction, you know. Um, so well, we just you know, tour the country and kind of find out exactly how people uh, were doing, what what the situation was like, and it, it was an, an amazing discovery because. Every every place I went, I learned about a new lie that was being told, you know, to people back home, and it it was deeply disillusioning for me. I mean, I, I know you've had experiences like this in journalism too, right? Where you find out that something you thought is totally wrong, and um, and that was a real eye opener for me. Like uh, completely wrong. Completely wrong. Yeah, exactly. And and moreover, that was proven relatively quickly, right? There was a massive financial collapse in, in 98. And then Putin came in uh, and there was a, a huge popular repudiation of you know, so the American style um, version of managed democracy that existed under Yeltsin. And that was real. I mean, Putin, for all, for all of his uh, problems. And I was a, a real critic of Putin's when I was there. Uh, there was no question that he was much more popular than, than Yeltsin. I mean, you know, the country was very embarrassed by Yeltsin um, because he was publicly drunk all the time. He was yes. dysfunctional. I mean, I think we're, we're living through some of those emotions now. Yes, we States. are. That's right. It's shameful. Yeah. And and so they they wanted to, you know, the, their word was a seal nail ruka, right? They wanted a strong hand uh, who would come in and kind of set things right and and compete with the Americans and they didn't they didn't like being thought of as a vassal state to the West. This is an ancient conflict for Russia and America. This goes back to the days of Peter the Great. Uh, you know the Slavophiles versus the uh, the, yes. the Western uh, you know the the pro Western crew. And it the pendulum swung the other way while I was there. You know and um, that was you know fascinating to watch, but it had some pretty serious consequences too. Well, yeah, that, that turned out to be right. Yeah. So, but as for journalism, like you you began to become disillusioned with the, the American version in the 90s. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. While I, while I was in Russia, um, yeah, I became disillusioned both with the format of it, 
you know, the, the kind of neutral third person uh, version of reporting where we pretend we're not having a point of view. Um, I didn't like that. You know, like, for instance, I would get sent out when I was at the Moscow Times, which was a paper I loved, but they would send me to all these events uh, where funny things would happen. I would come back and write it up with humor and they would tell me to take out the humor and write it in some other way that was like more serious. And I think that's a lie, right? Like if you if you go to a scene that's funny, like, for instance, I had the cover of this ridiculous press conference where. Prince Philip appeared for, I think, the World Wildlife Fund or something like that. And he's giving a speech to all these Russians about, you know, their backward attitudes about conservation and everything. <laughs> and in the middle of the speech, the, the hotel brings the spread, which includes booze. And all the reporters get up and leave Prince Philip talking by himself while they while they just eat all the food and drink and drink all the booze, and to me that's the story. Yeah, right? yeah, you know. So I I went home and I wrote that up, and they you know they kind of wanted me to do something else, like pretend it didn't happen. Right, exactly. And I thought, well, this you know this isn't right. You know, I mean, I was just a kid; I didn't really know, but I thought that there's something not quite right about 